The Boy in the Alamo by Margaret Cousins. Chapter one, Colonel Crockett calls. It was a cold day in January and Aunt Elvira had sent me out to bring in another load of wood. I went into the blacksmith shop because the blazing fire on the forge felt good. My brother Buck was standing at the anvil, banging on a piece of metal as if he was bound and determined to beat the stuffing out of it. What are you doing, Buck? I asked him. Buck didn't say a word. Uncle Todd was sorting out horseshoe nails. He looked at Buck and grinned. Just because Sarah Ellen Payne ran off and got herself married to another fellow is no reason for you to take out your spot on that helpless piece of iron. That's personification. Uncle Todd said, Buck gritted his teeth. I'm making me a knife, he hollered. What's Sarah Ellen Payne got to do with it? I hope you're not planning to scalp the bridegroom. Uncle Todd joshed him. I aim to get away from here, Buck muttered, go adventuring. I thought for a minute he was going to cry, except Buck was too old for that. He was 17. Anyway, he never did cry. Hey, Buck, I said, let me see. Hey, can I go with you? Course not, Buck said. You're just a tadpole. I felt my heart drop. I always went everywhere with Buck. Buck was my family. Ever since Mama died of the consumption and Papa fell in the fight with the Comanches, and we came to Nacogdoches to live with Uncle Todd and Aunt Elvira. I'm 12, I said, going on 13. You'd be scared to death out there in the big woods, Buck said, hammering on his knife. You get to bellowing like a lost calf. Simile. Who's scared? I yelled at him. Don't you call me coward. Don't pester him, Will. Uncle Todd said. He's got his dander up this morning over that little yellow-haired girl. I'm going to ride off, Buck said, stubborn. I'm going to join the army. You best stay here and learn blacksmithing, Uncle Todd said. Useful business in a new country like Texas. A land has to be forged. I'm going to go with you, I said to Buck. You're my brother. No, said Buck. Where I'm going, it might be dangerous. I turned my back on him and went and stood in the door of the shop. My feelings were hurt. It was then I saw the five horsemen break from the oak thicket and ride slowly across the clearing toward the shop. They looked big and dark against the sky, which was pale blue like the milk in Aunt Elvira's Crocs after she had skimmed off the cream simile. As they drew nearer, I saw they were strangers. I felt a prickle of excitement in my skin. Somebody's coming, I yelled out. When you saw strangers in Texas, you always yelled out. No telling who they might be. Uncle Todd hustled over to the door and Buck stopped beating the hot iron and came too. Looks like we're gonna shoe a horse, Uncle Todd said, and began to tie on his leather apron. The horses drew up a little way from the shop and the men got off. The leader was big and tall. He stood over six feet and was heavy built, but he walked easy like a puma, simile. He had blue eyes and a red face with square bones and a nose like a hawk, simile. And his hair was brown. He had on a buckskin shirt and pants and a coon cap with the ring tail hanging down his back. His voice was soft when he said good morning and there was something about him that drew you to him. The way the magnet picks up steel filings in the blacksmith shop, metaphor. I looked around at Buck and his eyes were shining. Howdy boy, the tall man said to me. Is this Hunter Smithy? I nodded my head. I felt the cat had got my tongue. It is that, Uncle Todd said, coming forward. Todd Hunter, at your service. I'm Davy Crockett, the stranger said. My traveler's gone and flung off his shoe. Colonel Crockett, Buck said. The same as if somebody had given him a big present. Simile. I should know you from hearing about you. I saw your picture once too. 
Well, now it's hard to forget such an ugly face, Colonel Crockett said, laughing loud, and called to the men to bring over the horse. The other four moseyed over to the shop, leading Davy's horse. One was short and fat. That was Thimble Rig. The tall, dark fellow, real good looking with sunburnt skin and brown eyes, was Ned Johnson, the bee hunter. The swarthy one, wearing an old blue sailor suit, was the pirate, and the dark, silent one was the Indian. Davy made us known, and Uncle Todd and Buck went about the shoeing. But Buck couldn't keep his mind on it. His eye followed Colonel Crockett everywhere. He was always restless, Davy Crockett was. He walked around, humming a tune, looking at Uncle Todd's muskets and homemade knives on the wall, whistling, switching his head. I heard about your fights with the Indians, Buck said, stuttering the way he did when he got excited. Yeah, said Davy. That was a while back. Papa was an Indian fighter, I put in, only I was too little to remember it. My brother-in-law fell to a Comanche war party, said Uncle Todd. Couldn't make him see sense. There is some fighting that has to be done, Davy said. No getting out of it. I hope you're aiming to settle in Texas, Colonel, Uncle Todd said. There's good land hereabouts. I am that, said Davy, but first I have to make a little journey. Is that so, Uncle Todd said, making polite talk. I'm riding to Bayar. Crockett said, as fast as I can get there. There won't be much settling down for anybody until Texas is free. Uncle Todd didn't say anything, but Buck's hammer clattered to the floor. The garrison there is in need of reinforcements, Colonel Crockett said. I'm looking for volunteers. I looked at Buck and I knew what was coming. Colonel Crockett, Buck said, drawing himself up. Can I ride with you? Have you ever done any soldiering? Davy asked. No, I haven't, Buck said, but I was born in Texas. It's my country and I can fight. I wished I had that Sarah Ellen by the scruff of her neck, Uncle Todd said. You're not but 17, Buck. You got no call to be honing for battle. You don't know a thing about it. Why can't you just stay where you belong and help me? cast the cannon. Give me liberty or give me death, Buck said. He read that in one of our school books. You best look to your uncle for common sense, Crockett said. I'm known far and wide for not having any. Will you take me as a volunteer, Buck asked. I can't promise you anything but hunger and cold and danger, Crockett said. It's not all bugle calls and flashing swords and flags flying. The way it's all cracked up to be, it's mud and pain and being scared way down in the bottom of your stomach. When he said that, I felt my heart pinch and I shivered. It sounded awful and I don't know why, but in spite of how it sounded, I wanted to go with him too. Will you take me? Buck asked again. Crockett laughed. I'll take you, he said. You're man enough to make up your own mind. He put out his hand and Buck shook it. Uncle Todd was beating a tattoo on the iron shoe. When do you go, he asked. We ride tomorrow, Crockett said. You best stay the night, Uncle Todd said. You, Will, go tell your Aunt Elvira we've got company. That's mighty kind of you, said Crockett. A taste of hot food would be welcome. When I went to the house and told Aunt Elvira, she put her apron over her face and sat down in the rocker and rocked back and forth. Oh, Billy, what will we do without Buck? When you see women folks cry, it's better to get out. I didn't know what to say to her. and I couldn't tell her that I was going with him. I couldn't tell anybody that. I went out and brought her in a great big load of wood and drew two buckets of water.